welcome to crashes in browsers. Um, I often talk about interactivity when I'm at publishing conferences, and I'm going to do that again here, but it's not from the perspective of standards or EPUB or really even technology. I'm going to talk about storytelling and why I am constantly harping on interactivity. It sort of a, it's going to be another one of these talks that walks through history, but uh, it's kind of a personal history. The future of books is something I've always been involved in. Uh, I had access to computers at an early age. And at the time, when you played video games, what that often meant was interacting with textual works. I think a lot of people here uh, either remember or are just sort of familiar with the kinds of games that uh, used to be these the kind of like most high-tech forms of interaction with computers. They don't look high-tech to us, but there were fairly sophisticated parsing systems to understand your input and you would receive uh, these descriptions and stories that you could move through. Now, a, a lot of these stories really were just kind of like glorified Dungeons and Dragons campaigns. You can kill monsters and move through uh, caves. But there were other more ambitious attempts to, to tell stories that, especially to me as a 12-year-old, um, you know, were about exploration, about uh, time travel, about like all the things that seem really cool to me about literature, but it was even better because it was on a computer and that was novel. Um, this was a real industry at the time. Um, this, this, it's actually kind of hard to understand what this headline means now, but it's not talking about books about computers. It's talking about what we would call e-books now or, or probably something more like, um, you know, enhanced e-books. Uh, but these were top-selling titles, millions of dollars in sales. Uh, there was a time when publishers were interested in acquiring technology companies in order to make these sorts of products, uh, rather than like today, it would almost certainly be the other way around. And what was really compelling to me, I mean, I enjoyed playing these games, but I was able to write them. This was, these were fairly sort of primitive interactions, so if you were a 12-year-old girl, you could make a game that was about, I mean, you don't have a lot to say when you're 12, right? So like, it's a game about walking around my grade school. Um, but you know, I could code this in really um, Commodore 64 basic, and I didn't understand really anything of what I was doing, but I could cobble together an experience that kind of looked like the commercial games. That was incredibly powerful and very cool, and has always, it's been fantastic for me to kind of come full circle to this thing that I had a passion for when I was a kid, essentially be able to do that all over again. But there was a problem with these works when you try to evaluate them as stories or as fiction. Uh, many times with, they were really kind of sold on the novelty part, which was how interactive they were, and that doesn't necessarily make for a compelling story. Uh, you don't want to have your experience of some kind of work you get to the very end of it and it's like, that's awesome, you can now do that like 70 trillion more times because um, you know, it, it was really meant to be a game and not a work of authorship. Oh, we can see what my email is, that's cool. <laughs> Tech fail, awesome. What eventually happened to this kind of style, it, <laughs> see if anyone's like, you know, giving us money or acquiring us. Uh, what really happened to this style of of telling stories moved away from just purely textual works as computing caught up. And uh, you know, for a while there, there in the 90s, people really sort of fell in love again with the idea of exploring a virtual world, uh, but now from more of a graphical perspective. Uh, and in fact, games like Myst were sort of explicitly wordless. The, Eventually, even this idea of the kind of adventure game as, a, as an independent genre has now been absorbed into other forms of video gaming where you still have a compelling story, um, but it's often in a different modality than just explicitly about exploration. But the other thing that happened in 1993, uh, and it's so cool, is like the second mosaic screenshot today. Like, it's just the best conference ever. Um, the, the thing about about the introduction of the browsers, it did, did, did not just enable t big corporations to make websites about Pepsi so you could learn about Pepsi. It let humans write 
in many cases, what would be their first and only kind of computing program. And you give normal people technology tools, they do horrible things with them that you don't really ever want to look at again, but it's incredibly democratizing. And uh, once people could use a tool that to us is so simple as a hyperlink, uh, this is something that got authors excited. So uh, this, is a, this is a novel called 253. Uh, it's written by the, the British author Jeff Ryman and it was originally published as a website, and then later, two years later, um, so the website came out in 96, and it came out in print in 98. Uh, it, this is hypertext fiction, and this sort of became a thing, uh, especially in the late 90s, either mediated by, uh, by the web or, or you know, proprietary software like HyperCard. Um, the cool thing about this website, which Obviously, it, you know when this was made. This is actually like not from the Internet Archive. This is still live. It looks exactly the same. It's just a time capsule. Um, and so this story is just similar to a lot of hypertext fiction. Uh, it's not a game. It's a, it's a story. Uh, but it's a sort of a series of set pieces. And the allegedly compelling part of it is that you're can click on these hyperlinks and move between the story. And you know, I guess the idea is that the emergent narrative uh, you know, is sort of different for each person. Uh, I love Jeff Ryman, and I was really excited when this came out, because like, OK, once again, now I'm working on the web, and authors are writing stuff for the web, and yay, I'm the future of books all over again. Uh, but hypertext kind of, it caused a lot of anxiety in the literary world because of all the things that scholars worry about with you know, fixity and truth and yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, but the problem kind of resolved itself because this is a thing much like the early adventure games that kind of had a peak and then a decline. Um, so this is just like the Google Ngram viewer for the phrase. And you can see very clearly it's sort of this idea of hypertext storytelling uh, you know, peaked around 99, 2000, just you know, in time for people to start learning how to tell the stories. And then they kind of found out they're sort of boring. Um, my feeling about hypertext stories is that they just are kind of lying there. It's like the author has walked up to you and just dropped all their ideas uh, on a table in front of you, and you can sort of pick your way through it. But it's missing a lot of things that, make, that are great about novels. It, you have lost the ability to have timing, to have rhythm. There is no emotional arc because it's really a, just sort of a series of a kind of drunk walk through the story. And, and there are better and worse versions of this. And not, uh, it's not as if people weren't able to do interesting things here. Um, but this was also not the future of books. But I, I've been thinking a lot about the lessons that you can learn from these two sort of forms. Um, you know, one of them, I have a particular love for the game world, and I'm still an avid video gamer. And I think that the things that are great about games is that they are, um, you know, this is a feature. They're commercial, they're, or they're typically commercial. Uh, they have a mandate that people have to actually have fun engaging with them, that people will want to buy this thing. Uh, the things that are sort of a drawback about using the game model is the sense that you are choosing your own adventure. Like, that's, that's a cute toy, but that's not a story. You know, that's not an author's vision. But they have this kind of user-centric approach. Uh, on the other hand, those sort of hypertext works, they're more serious, they're more thoughtful, they're often written by real authors. Uh, they're, but they, can, they feel to me kind of dead. Uh, so I wanted to think about things that could merge these two forms. And the only way in which I'll say, talk about technology is just that now we're in a position where uh, we're giving people devices and teaching them how to read on screens. So this is a time where people are very receptive to, make, to new forms, but I think they have to be fun and they have to be, have to be stories. So in 2001, uh, I've been working with a woman named Emily Short. She, is, uh, she describes herself as a consultant in interactive narrative, which sounds sort of froofy, but she, she really works with mostly video game developers who want to tell better stories. Um, so they'll come to her with like fairly typical uh, like storytelling problems, like our, our game just kind of falls flat halfway through, or no one understands the motivation of our characters, 
or you know, in these increasingly large games, you know, the player might meet 300 people in this world and they all have to have things to say and motivations. Uh, so she kind of sits right in the middle of these two worlds where she works with games, but she works with stories. Uh, so I commissioned a piece from her and I gave her a few constraints. I said, uh, I, want it, I want it to be fun. I want it to be engaging. Uh, it should work on some kind of, it should at least be compatible with a touch-based device, although it doesn't have to be touch. Uh, and I said it had to be short because I didn't want to do a lot of work. And so she wrote this thing for me and she gives this great title because it kind of has dual meanings, but uh, you know, to me it's like authorship, this is a story, this is a revolution. Um, but the name really is referring to the fact that what she wrote is a sort of epistolary short story. It's about the concept of authorship and the revolution here is the, eight, is the French Revolution because this is set in this kind of alternate uh, French Revolution universe. And she, she said that she took these, these kind of two approaches uh, that she thinks can apply to digital narratives um, that are interactive kind of across the board. There's the goal to, or the impetus for the user to want to expand the narrative. That's the sort of gaming concept that like, I want to choose what's going to happen next to some extent. I want to move things forward. I want to propel the story. Uh, then there's this more hypertext impulse, which is that I want to maybe fall into a corner of the story or explore one person's motivation. Uh, or maybe I'm playing it now for the second or third time and I want to just uh, skip through some of the this exposition and, and, and focus on maybe just sort of the key motivations of the players. And I like that because that sort of fit with this dichotomy that I already had. Now I'm not going to demo the piece, although I can show it uh, on my laptop to people who are interested. And, and we're, we will publish it, it's just not quite, um, doesn't have all the touches that I want. But I asked her to write a, a kind of an author statement. She sent me this like 5,000 word like, so this is not all of it, but I'll post the whole thing. Um, but really, she thought that one of the ways to make the story compelling was to make it be about people and their motivations, not do you swing the axe at the troll, um, but really how do people talk to each other and when you're thinking about writing, uh, you know, what is that sort of revision process that happens? Um, but still, something that has to ultimately be fiction and interesting. Uh, so what we did, the piece is in, is in HTML and CSS, and it sort of moves back and forth between uh, this sort of background narrative, and this is the opening scene uh, that you can see right here. Um, but the sort of key interaction are these l series of letters that the characters are writing to each other back and forth. Um, they, there are multiple characters, but there's sort of two primary, a husband and wife, who are kind of plotting against each other. Uh, and I'm not a designer, so we actually want um, probably some more professional help here, but we're thinking through the, the user experience. We don't want it to look too much like a website, and right now it kind of does. Um, but what you're presented with is, a, is a, essentially an, a draft of a letter that usually is either too abrupt or impetuous or reveals too much or not enough. If you try, cool. If you try to s like send the letter when it's incomplete, when it's not ready, um, Right now what happens is that the text that you need to revise sort of jiggles. Uh, originally we had it colored and that felt too much like a hyperlink and you know, all you want to do is like click on it. Uh, instead I'm sort of more interested in how we can make text move and breathe. And then you're often given either a choice to remove a passage or change a passage and change it depending on what mood you want. And, and none of this really has an effect on this overall story that was sort of a design goal. It's, it's just more about you are learning what's happening behind the scenes through making these choices, um, but you can send these letters sort of withholding or, or expressing information as you want. And then just like the tiny geek part is, uh, I am really enamored of projects that can be done, or creative projects that can be done with very, very tiny teams. And I, so here, in addition to making this particular piece, we wanted to secondarily make the platform that the piece runs on, um, but I wanted platform to be very thin. so. She came up with a very simple XML format that expresses the story. You know, here's the text that you're given, here's how it has to change, here are the choices you can have. I did the, the thing that just reads that 
and puts it into a browser. And then I think the person who's sort of missing here is the is the is the, an actual talented designer who could do um, a lot of the things that we'd like to do to help you understand the mood of any particular character, where they physically are in space, uh, and 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 a less sort of what, kind of clunky UI method for choosing uh, these sentences that you can you can send or withhold. I think the important part here is that it has to have this nice pacing. It has to feel like something that you want to experience from start to finish, and then as a reader, you know that you've finished, that it's not uh, just sort of a pile of stories in front of you that have no rhythm, and at the same time that it's you know, still something that we can fund fundamentally recognize as a story. That's what I got, thank you.